This podcast is a conscious effort to fight the impending darkness that surrounds us by filling that void with light. Here we focus on truths that surround us, whether found in myth, ancient texts, scripture, literature, voices from the past and present. Together we will find the traces, pull the threads, and follow the sparks along the way. Welcome to Reflecting Light, and here is your host, Mandy Green. Hello, welcome to Reflecting Light. It's wonderful to be with you on this eve of of Holy Week for Easter and a very beautiful Passover to our Jewish friends. Passover begins tonight, March 27th at sundown. Today's podcast is called How Everything Turns Away. Now, every podcast I feel passionately about, but this one really, really hit. And I hope the impact of what's been brought to my attention and some of these sources will have that same impact on you. A couple of threads we're going to pull today. First of all, in a matter of business, I wanted to talk a little bit first about travel opportunities. Because of COVID and all the things that have happened, all of my travel has been pushed to this year. So the Britain tour is already full with the waiting list. I'm sorry if you didn't jump on that. That one's full. I am taking a group to Israel with Legacy Tours and Travel. We just did an information session that was recorded. And so you can contact them if you'd like to look at that presentation. It's like 25 minutes. We walk through the itinerary and look at some of the beautiful things that we study together. I'm also doing an information session for Forbidden Adventure Travel this Tuesday at 7 p.m., on Zoom. So if you want to access their Facebook page at Forbidden Adventure, we will go over that itinerary. It looks like I'll be taking a trip there in October and January. I'm excited to get out and travel again. I can't think of anything that I spend my money on that has more of an impact on my spirit and my soul and my mind and my heart than travel. So if it's speaking to you, you'll know. You'll know if you're supposed to go. When people ask me, I never push it. The point of this is not to push it, but it will speak to you and you'll feel something in your heart. And I can honestly say that everything that's good in my life came from taking a plunge and going on that first trip, honestly. So if it speaks to you, those are, those are the opportunities to travel with me. And certainly you don't have to travel with me at all, but get out and see this world. I think the more of this world we see, the more we understand that we're so much part of the same family and we share so many of the same truths and we're far more alike than different. And in a world that's trying to divide us and create division and create hate and create animosity and dehumanize different populations, it's so important that we remain plugged into this divine family and realize that we all should look out for each other. Another thing I'd like to address this morning is the art in the Manti Temple. Now, if you know anything about the Manti Temple owned by the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, it's a beautiful edifice. It was built by pioneers and there's a room in there called the World Room that Minerva Teichert, a famous female artist who is gifted did the murals for and it's in danger of being torn down. Those are going to be destroyed and that beautiful piece of history will be lost irreplaceably for generations and generations. Now, here's where I don't want you to turn away. And as we go more into the podcast, you'll see where I'm coming from. But It's really important that if you're interested in preserving art, if you're interested in preserving history and relics of the past and supporting female art, she's a lone wolf in the world of LDS art, then you need to do something about it. I'll put the email address for Juan Becerra. He's a manager of the government and community relations team. And email Brother Becerra and say, you're not okay with this, that this is important to culture and history and heritage, that this renovation is not taking place and that these, not just her mural, the entire structure of the temple was built by pioneers. There's 
amazing freestanding spiral staircases. My own great grandfather would walk the 12 miles every day from his home near Ephraim to go work on that temple. And I think it's really important that that temple interior is an important piece of our heritage, that the original should be preserved in situ, meaning in place the way they exist, and that efficiency would not override the beauty of that structure, and that there's ways around tearing down the beauty that's in there. You know, my friend, Brother Nibley, well, we're not personal friends, but he said in his essay, Leaders and Managers, if management must reflect the corporate image in tasteless, trendy new buildings, down come the fine old pioneer monuments. Already the Salt Lake Temple has been gutted. St. George, Logan, the Manti is the last standing giant. So if art and women's history and pioneer history and beauty are important to you, please use that email address that I'm going to leave in the show notes, as well as if you're a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, send that letter to your bishop and your stake president, and I'll also give you a mailing address to send it to church headquarters. I think it's important that we don't turn away from something that's worth discussion. The title of the podcast today comes from a speech written by Lois Lowry called How Everything Turns Away. I will put a PDF of this speech in the show notes. My friends, in my mind, this is required reading. It is so masterfully addressed. The question is posed and then she addresses it. So I'll start by quoting from how she got the title. Slory was the author of The Giver, Number of the Stars. She's written a lot of books. And this speech comes from a time in history, again, where people wanted to get rid of the book, The Giver. They thought it was too intense. It shouldn't be in any of the libraries in a particular city. And they wanted to ban the book. And this was her response to it. So I'd like to start by quoting from her and where she got this beautiful question. I happen to be a great fan of W.H. Auden. Once, in fact, at a dinner party, the talk turned to poetry and a man sitting on my left, a complete stranger, someone I had never met before that night, asked me what my favorite line from all of poetry was. I replied, lay your sleeping head, my love, human on my faithless arm. And he looked absolutely terrified and quickly turned to the person on his other side. What a great question to ask. What is your favorite line of poetry? I digress. All right. And then she has the title, How Everything Turns Away. And to continue quoting from her, it's true, I think, that we turn away from things. We turn away sometimes because it is too painful and we don't want to face it. And sometimes we turn away simply because it is too hard and asks more of us than we have to give. And sometimes we are simply not paying attention. The poem by Auden from which the line comes is called Musée de Beaux-Arts, and the final stanza speaks of an actual painting that hangs in the Museum of Fine Arts in Brussels. And let me quote from Auden's poem. In Bruegel's Icarus, for instance, how everything turns away quite leisurely from the disaster. The plowman may have heard the splash, the forsaken cry, but for him it was not an important failure. The sun shone as it had on the white legs disappearing into the green water and the expensive, delicate ship that must have seen something amazing A boy falling out of the sky had somewhere to get to and sailed calmly on. Oh, those lines. Now, if you don't know anything about Icarus, let's talk about Icarus. Icarus was the son of a famous craftsman, Daedalus, in Greek mythology. He was the creator of that amazing labyrinth created for King Minos of Crete, where the Minotaur was kept. And that people had to make their way through the labyrinth. And he has amazing things he's created. So for his son, he created these wings. He taught Icarus how to fly, but warned him not to fly too close to the sun because it would melt the wax on the wings and he would fall to his death. 
while Icarus was flying all over and having a magnificent time. And it was so intoxicating that at one point he did fly too close to the sun and the wax started melting under the heat of the sun and his wings dissolved and he fell into the sea and drowned. They say that the Icarian Sea is named after him, as well as the island nearby. Here we have this amazing story of Icarus, who's flown higher than any human before him. Can you imagine the things that Icarus would have to tell you? Auden saw this painting and noticed how everything turned away. Lowry says, I had quoted it back in 1990 in accepting the Newbery Medal for Number of the Stars, a book set in Europe in 1943. A time when too many people turned away. And then she gives this beautiful description of the painting. This will be the art for this podcast. So I encourage you to look at the show notes and look at the picture or look it up online. Or if you watch on YouTube, it will be the picture that you see. And this is her description of it. First, because we don't have the painting in front of us, let me describe the scene. It's actually called Landscape with the Fall of Icarus. And it's a complex landscape. A farmer wearing a bright crimson shirt is guiding a plow behind a horse in the foreground. And beyond him, past a border of shrubbery, another man, a shepherd, stands beside his dog while his sheep graze nearby. Behind him, across a vast bay, a great city arises. And surrounding the bay, jagged cliffs and mountains emerge. Several sailing vessels are moving through the turquoise water, and all of it is bathed in a golden light from the low sun beyond. In the lower right-hand corner of the painting, in a place where the sea is dark, shadowed by one of the ships, two bare legs are visible in the water. You can almost hear the thrashing sounds and feel the anguish of the drowning boy. And it's not just a drowning boy. It's a colossal tragedy. He has flown up to the sun His attempt is amazing and his failure is monumental. He has flown higher and he has fallen further than any human ever has. And no one is noticing. They're too busy, maybe. They're in a hurry, perhaps. They have somewhere to get to. Or perhaps it is just too demanding, too scary, too sad. And the expensive, delicate ship that must have seen something amazing... A boy falling out of the sky had somewhere to get to and sailed calmly on. Can you imagine? We all do it. We all turn away. And the expensive, delicate ship that must have seen something amazing, a boy falling out of the sky, had somewhere to get to and sailed calmly on. How everything turns away. When I see that line, something amazing, I think of the first Incredibles movie. How that kid's sitting on his driveway waiting for him. And he says, what are you looking at? What are you waiting for? And he goes, something amazing. And Mr. Incredible says, me too, kid. Me too. Perhaps the amazings are present in our life if we are present even if they're wrapped in pain and suffering. The author goes on to say that a reader wrote in and talked about how the giver had helped her reframe her experience. And here's what she has to say. I read the book, The Giver, when I was about 18 years old, and I really identified with the message of how when we become so afraid of experiencing pain and difficulty, we become afraid of life itself. She went on to tell me things about her experiences and about decisions she had made based on what she had learned from reading that book years before. Her decisions had to do with facing pain. She had, in essence, chosen not to turn away. I was going through my Facebook feed earlier today. One of my dear mission friends, Rick Bruno, lost a child to childhood cancer. Another neighbor, Stephanie Driscoll, also lost a child to cancer. And they both use that platform as a way to be positive, to encourage love in the world. They haven't turned away. And as I was scrolling through Rick's Love is Everywhere auction, 
there's a picture of a young boy who just was is ravaged fighting cancer right now and it's not an easy picture to look at and I scrolled past it and I remembered my message today and I made myself scroll right back up and look at that picture and read that dear boy's story and not turn away from the pain or the difficulty or the hardness of that challenge that I'm not even experiencing, but I can do something good and not turning away. That's why we look at humanity. That's why we write in about history and beautiful architecture. And this is one of the reasons that Mary Magdalene is my hero. There are so many reasons she could have turned away particularly in that last week of the Savior's life. I should say mortal life, because he goes way beyond that, and he existed way before that. But even in the midst of knowing everything she knew and everything he knew, she didn't turn away. And many, almost all of his other followers did. Can you imagine the cost of turning away at that point? Can you imagine the cost of not turning away? They both have a high cost, but what one are you more able to live with after the fact? I do have to give props to John the Beloved. He didn't turn away. And Nicodemus, that's an interesting character. He, I think, is so much like all of us where we waffle at moments. We're very strong. In other moments, we turn away. His depiction in Season two of The Chosen is when he turns away because it's going to cost him so much. Such a poignant moment. And there's a lot of apocryphal literature about how Nicodemus, after the death of the Savior, does not turn away and changes the side he's on. We'll talk about him in another podcast. Joseph of Arimathea goes and begs for the body of Jesus. Again, didn't turn away. It required so much And Mary did not turn away at any of those moments. I'd like to quote from the Gospel of the Beloved Companion. This is my favorite work. I don't lend it out because I just need this book in my home. I super recommend it if you haven't read it. I'll put a link to it in the show notes as well. I'm going to read from page 59, chapter 32. Then six days before Pesach, which is Passover, Yeshua came to Bethany, where Eleazar was whom he had brought back to life. There they had prepared a supper for him and for the other disciples. Then Miriam, the beloved companion, took a jar of oil of pure and expensive spikenard and poured it upon the head of Yeshua and anointed him. And the house was full of the sweet fragrance of the ointment. And seeing what she had done, the disciples therefore grumbled against her amongst themselves. Here you have this gorgeous, powerful, spiritual moment of Mary anointing Christ for his death, I believe, as the bride to her bridegroom. Can you imagine this moment? Many of those in the room turn away from the beauty of that moment. They have earthly temporal concerns. Now, I just got back from Egypt Just a little side note, thread to pull here. Alabaster is mined in Luxor. And to get the ointment out of a bottle, you would have to break the bottle. Alabaster is expensive. So not only the oil itself, which is ridiculously priced, but the container it's in is also very holy. And you would have to break the container to get the oil out of it. So many symbols there. And it makes you say, where is this oil from? Egypt, probably, which is a whole nother thread and story. We'll pull it another day. All right. Verse four, but hearing this, Yeshua said to them, leave her be. If you look at the account in John, that has an exclamation point by it. She has anointed me for what I am come to do and done what she is appointed to do. Only from the truth, I tell you, whenever they speak of me, What she has done will also be told in memory of her. This is one of a handful of events that is actually in each of the four recorded Gospels. Go read them all. 
you do not know or understand what she has done. I tell you this, when all have abandoned me, only she shall stand beside me like a tower. A tower built on a high hill and fortified cannot fall, nor can it be hidden. From this day forth, she shall be known as Migdala, for she shall be as a tower to my flock. And the time will soon come when her tower shall stand alone by mine. Isn't that beautiful? According to this text, that's when she's given the title, the Migdala. The tower means the high place, the exalted one. She is the tower and everyone else will turn away. But she won't. Go reread the Song of Songs how she searches for her beloved. And the first line in John 20 is so powerful. Don't skip over that while it was yet dark. She stands at the tomb while it is yet dark with everything to lose. This is not a time to be associated with Jesus of Nazareth. Women are not protected in this time and place. She's outside the walls of the city and she will not be moved. No power in earth or hell will move this woman from the tomb of her beloved. She doesn't turn away. And immediately after, oh, can you just freeze these moments? But immediately after, verse 5, but the disciples did not understand his words. Yuda, the one of Keriot, who kept the money purse, complained and asked Yeshua, Why was this ointment not sold and the money given to the poor? And Yeshua therefore answered him, The poor you will always have with you, but me you will not always have. And later in this book, I just want to add a little footnote here in chapter 40, verse 9, when they go to gather the disciples and say that Christ has been resurrected and he'd like to see them. It says that they sent messengers to tell the other disciples what the Migdala had witnessed. But it was many days before they returned to Bethany, as being in fear of the priests and Pharisees, all had fled the city, each back to his own. In this way, they had fulfilled the prophecy that Yeshua had spoken when he said to them, Do you now believe? Behold, the time is coming, yes, and has now come that you will be scattered, everyone to his own, and you will leave me all alone but one. So beautiful that she's the one to greet him at the tomb. All right, I'd like to go back to Lori's essay. She actually talks about three pictures, but I'm only going to focus on one for the sake of time. But I want to tie this all home. I want to bring this to your present situation. It is 1948. I have just finished sixth grade, and my father, the career military man, has now moved his family to post-war Japan. We go by ship from New York down through Panama across the Pacific, a journey of many weeks, and my father is waiting for us in Japan, and the green bike is waiting there for me too. He moves us into an American-style house. To my disappointment, because I had envisioned a house with sliding walls and straw matted floors surrounded by other Western style houses and all of it encircled by a wall. But my bike is my freedom. I ride the green bike again and again through the gate of the compound's wall into the bustling section of Tokyo called Shibuya. I hope I said that right. I slow my bike when I discover a school and I linger there watching when the children in their dark blue uniforms play in the schoolyard. One boy, just about my age, stares back at me. We look intently at each other. Then I mount my bike again and ride away. And then later in the essay, she revisits this picture again and has you look at this picture of her on her bike in Japan. And she says, Finally, there is the girl on the bike. She left Japan when she was 14. She grew up here and there, went to college, married, had children, eventually grandchildren. She became a writer. It is not true to say that I thought often about the Japanese boy, the one from whom I had turned away, to whom I had been afraid to say hello, 
but from time to time, remembering my childhood, his face, his solemn look swam into my memory. In 1994, when the giver was awarded the Newbery Medal, a picture book called Grandfather's Journey was awarded the Caldecott. Its author-illustrator was Alan Say. Alan is Japanese, although he lived in the USA since he was a young man. He gave me a copy of Grandfather's Journey and inscribed it to me. In return, I signed the giver to him, writing my name in Japanese below my usual signature. He chuckled looking at it and asked me how I happened to be able to do that. You can picture the ensuing conversation. I lived in Japan when I was 11, 12, 13, I explained. What years, asks Alan Say. 1948, 49, 50. I was born in 37. Me too. We're the same age. Where did you live? Tokyo, I tell him. Me too. He says, what part? Shibuya. So did I. Where did you go to school? Alan asked me. Maguro. I went by bus each day. I went to the school in Shibuya. I remember a school there, I tell him. I used to ride my bike past it. Silence. Then, were you the girl on the green bike? Alan and I are close friends now, but we had lost 57 years of friendship because we had both turned away. To do otherwise in that place and that time would have been too hard. Wow. Props to Lois Lowry for writing and sharing this beautiful essay and these true examples from her life and writing powerful literature about what happens when we turn away. This week for Holy Week, I want you to have these words ring in your soul and in your ears, and in your heart, and ask how you are turning away. And what's so staggering about Holy Week for me this year is the tremendous courage and beauty and humanity of a Christ that at every turn in his ministry and this last week showed with his attention and his love and his presence that he would not turn away from the task appointed to him. He was always present in the sacred now. And he took those questions from Judas. And he was anointed by Mary. And he suffered. He asked that the cup be removed. But notice that the question wasn't, remove me from this. It was asking that the obstacle that stood between him and the end of that mission be removed, but notice that he is set on that path. One of my favorite lines about the Savior is, his face was set toward Jerusalem, or his face was set like a flint. He wasn't going to budge. He was not going to turn away from the pain, from the difficulty, from the hardness. He would take it on courageously and with beauty and faith and courage, as would Mary. Never were there better heroes. And a Greek hero is someone who is half divine, half human. That's an appropriate epithet. And the beauty in their relationship. Think of her confidence in him, knowing that he wouldn't turn away. And the anchor it was for him to know that she would be the only one who wouldn't turn away from him, that she would be there at the end of it all. That's love. That's dyadic power. And that is our opportunity this week to go forward with conviction and faith and courage and not turn away. I wish you love and light in this endeavor this week. Thank you for joining us. We hope this episode lit a spark inside of you. For show notes and other information, please visit our website, reflectinglight.org. And if you feel this program illuminated your mind or heart, consider making a donation to fund further episodes. Until next time.